like to talk about some of the problems that the human race is facing. Some of these problems are global, some are national, some are local. But they're all tied together. They're tied together by arithmetic. The arithmetic isn't very difficult. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to try to convince you that the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. So we're going to talk about the arithmetic of compound interest, of inflation, of steady growth. This is the arithmetic of the exponential function. Now the exponential function is used to describe the size of anything that's growing steadily. If you had something growing 5% per year, you'd write the exponential function to show how large that growing quantity was year after year. And so we're talking about a situation where the time that's required for the growing quantity to increase by a fixed fraction is a constant. 5% per year, the 5% is a fixed fraction, the per year is a fixed length of time. Now that's what we want to talk about, ordinary, steady growth. Well, if it takes a fixed length of time to grow 5%, it follows it takes a longer fixed length of time to grow 100%. Now the longer time is called the doubling time. We need to know how you calculate the doubling time, and fortunately, it's easy. You just take the number 70, divide it by the percent growth per unit time, and that gives you the doubling time. And so our example of 5% per year, when you divide the 5 into 70, you find that growing quantity will double in size every 14 years. Now, you might ask, well, where did the 70 come from? The answer is it's approximately 100 multiplied by the natural logarithm of 2. If you wanted the time to triple, you'd use the natural logarithm of 3. So you can see it's very logical, but it's not important to remember so much where it came from. It's important to remember 70. Now, I wish we could get every person to make this mental calculation every time we see a percent growth rate of anything in a news story. For example, if you saw a story that said things had been growing 8.7% per year for several recent years, you wouldn't bat an eyelash. But when you see a headline that says the prison population could double in eight years, you say, well, my heavens, what's happening? And the answer is 8.7% growth per year. Notice when you express it as a percent, most people don't have any real understanding what it means after one year. But express it in terms of doubling, people begin to understand. And the journalists use this all the time. State court appeals double in a decade. Well, what's the growth rate that gives you doubling in a decade? You take that number 70, divide it by the 10 of the decade, you get 7. 7% 7 per year gives you doubling every decade. But could you write a headline saying state court appeals growing 7% per year? That wouldn't get anyone's attention. If you want to get people's attention, you have to talk about doubling. And I think it's very important that we convert every percent growth rate we see in any news story, convert it into a doubling time so we can get an appreciation of what's happening. But now, do you really know what 7% per year means? Let's take an example from Colorado. The cost of an all-day lift ticket at Colorado's Vail Ski Area has been growing 7% per year ever since Vail first opened in 1963. At that time, you paid $5 for an all-day lift ticket at Vail. But it's been growing 7% per year ever since. So by 1973, the cost had doubled to $10. By 1983, it was $20. By 1993, it was over $40. And if this continues, by the year 2003, you will pay $80 a day for an all-day lift ticket at Colorado's Vail Ski Area. Now, did you know that that's what 7% per year means? Most people don't have any idea about this. Let's take another example of 7% per year. Let's take an example of compound interest. Suppose I put $1 in the bank at 7% compound interest. How large would the bank account be? in 300 years. Well, you take the 70, divide by 7, you get the doubling time is 10 years. You divide 10 into 300, you find it's going to double 30 times. And so the size of our bank account will be a number of dollars equal to 2 raised to the power 30, which means a chain of 32s multiplied together. And the answer is it's a little over $1 billion and your interest would be coming in at the rate of $2.38 per second. That's what 7% means. Let's look at another example of inflation. In the year 1626, Manhattan Island was purchased from the Native Americans for $24. If that $24 had been put in a savings account, what interest rate would be required? 
the dollars in the account today would be equal to the assessed valuation of all the taxable property in New York City? And the answer is slightly over 6% per year would give you a transition from $24 in 1626 to the assessed valuation of New York City today. That's what we have with compound interest. That's what we have with inflation. So let's look at a generic graph of something that's growing steadily. After one doubling time, the growing quantity is up to twice its initial size. Two doubling times, it's up to four times its initial size. Then it goes to 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512. And in just 10 doubling times, it's 1,024 times its initial size. Well, you can see if you tried to make a graph of that on ordinary graph paper, the graph will go right through the ceiling. Well, let's look now at the enormous numbers you can get with just a modest number of doublings. Legend has it that the game of chess was invented by a mathematician who worked for a king. And the king was very pleased. He said, I want to reward you. And the mathematician said, my needs are modest. If you'll just take my new chess board and on the first square place one grain of wheat, on the next square double the one to make two, on the next square double the two to make four. We'll just keep doubling till you double for every square. That will be an adequate payment. Now we can guess that the king thought, well, this foolish man, I was ready to give him a real reward. All he asked for is just a few grains of wheat. Well, let's see what's involved in this. We note that there are eight grains on the fourth square. Now I can get this number eight by multiplying three twos together. It's two times two times two. It's one two less than the number of the square. Now that follows in each case. So on the last square, we'd find the number of grains by multiplying 63 twos together. Now let's look at the way the totals build up. When we have one grain on the first square, the total on the board is one. We add two grains, that makes a total three. We put on four grains, now the total is seven. Well, seven is a grain less than eight. It's a grain less than three twos multiplied together. Fifteen is a grain less than four twos multiplied together. Well, that continues in each case. So when we're done, the total number of grains will be one grain less than the number I get multiplying 64 twos together. And my question is, well, how much wheat is that? You know, would that be a nice pile here in the studio? Would it fill the building? Would it cover the county to a depth of two meters? How much wheat are we talking about? The answer is it's roughly 400 times the 1990 worldwide harvest of wheat. That could be more wheat than humans have harvested in the entire history of this earth. And you say, well, how did you get such a big number? And the answer is it was simple. We just started with one grain, but we let the number grow steadily till it had doubled a mere 63 times. Now there's something else very important. We should note that the growth in any doubling time is greater than the total of all of the preceding growth. For example, when we put eight grains on the fourth square, the eight is larger than the total of seven that were already on the board. When we put 32 grains on the sixth square, the 32 is larger than the total of 31 that were already on the board. Every time the growing quantity doubles, it takes more than all that you'd used before. Now let's translate that into the energy crisis. It's an ad from the year 1975. It asks the question, could America run out of electricity? America depends on electricity. Our need for electricity actually doubles every 10 or 12 years. Now that's an accurate reflection of a very long history of steady growth of the electric industry in the United States growth at a rate of around 7% per year, which gives you doubling every 10 years. Now, with all that history, they expected the growth would go on forever. Now, fortunately, it stopped. Not because anyone understood this arithmetic. It stopped for other reasons. But let's ask, what if? Suppose the growth had continued. Then we would see here the thing we just saw on the chessboard. In the decade following the appearance of this ad, in that 10 years, the amount of electrical energy we would have consumed in this country would have been greater than the total of all of the electrical energy we had ever used in the entire preceding history of our nation. Now, did you realize that anything is completely acceptable, a 7% growth per year, could give such an incredible consequence in such a modest period of time? Now, that's exactly what President Carter was referring to in his speech on energy. One of his statements was this. He said, and in each of those decades, more oil was consumed than in all of mankind's previous history. Now, by itself, that is a stunning statement. But now you can understand that the president was telling us a simple consequence of arithmetic of 7% growth each year in world oil consumption, and that was the historic figure up until the 1970s. 
Now, there's another beautiful consequence of this arithmetic. If you take 70 years as a period of time, and note that that's roughly one human lifetime, then any percent growth continued steadily for 70 years gives you an overall increase by a factor that's very easy to calculate. For example, 4% per year, you find the factor by applying four twos together. It's a factor of 16. Now, a few years ago, one of the newspapers here in Boulder, Colorado, quizzed the nine members of our Boulder City Council and asked them, what rate of growth of Boulder's population do you think it would be good to have in the coming years? Now, the nine members of the Boulder City Council gave answers ranging from a low of 1% per year. Now, that happens to match the present rate of growth of the population of the United States. We are not at zero population growth. The number of Americans is increasing each year by about 2.7 million people. No member of the Boulder City Council said Boulder should grow less rapidly than the United States is growing. Now, the highest answer any council member gave was 5% per year. Well, you know, I felt compelled. I had to write him a letter and say, did you know that 5% per year for just 70 years, and you know, I can remember when 70 years used to seem like an awful long time, but it doesn't seem so long to me now. Well, that means Boulder's population would increase by a factor of 32. That is where today we have one overloaded sewer treatment plant in 70 years. We need 32 overloaded sewer treatment plants. Now, did you realize that anything as completely all-American as 5% growth per year could give such an incredible consequence in such a modest period of time? Our city council people had zero understanding of this very simple arithmetic. Well, a few years ago, I had a class of non-science students. We were interested in problems of science and society. We spent a lot of time learning to use semi-logarithmic graph paper, which is printed in such a way that these equal intervals along the vertical axis each represent an increase by a factor of 10. And the reason one uses this special paper is that on this kind of paper, a straight line represents steady growth. Now, we worked a lot of examples. I said to the students, let's talk about inflation. Let's talk about 7% per year. It wasn't this high when we did it. It's been much higher since then. Unfortunately, it's lower now. And I told the students, you have about 60 years life expectancy ahead of you. Let's see what some common things will cost if we have 60 years of 7% annual inflation. Well, the students found that a 55 cent gallon of gasoline will cost $35.20. 250 for a movie will be $160. The $15 sack of groceries that my mother used to buy for a dollar and a quarter, that'll be $960. A $100 suit of clothes will be $6,400. A $4,000 automobile will be a quarter of a million dollars. And a $45,000 home will be nearly $3 million. Well, I gave the students these data. These came from a Blue Cross Blue Shield ad that appeared in Newsweek magazine. And the ad gave these figures to show the cost escalation of gallbladder surgery in the year since 1950 when that surgery cost $351. And I said, make a semi-logarithmic plot. Let's see what's happening. The students found that the first four points lined up on a straight line whose slope indicated 6% inflation per year, but the fourth, fifth, and sixth were on a steeper line, almost 10% inflation per year. Well, then I said, run this steep line out to the year 2000. Let's get an idea what gallbladder surgery might cost. And the answer is $25,000. Now, the lesson there is awfully clear. If you're thinking about gallbladder surgery, do it now. In the summer of 1986, the news reports indicated that the world population had reached the number 5 billion people, growing at the rate of 1.7% per year. Now, your reaction to 1.7 might be to say, well, that's so small, nothing bad could ever happen at 1.7% per year. Well, then you calculate the doubling time, you find it's only 41 years. So I can tell young people in college today, I can say before you are my age, it's most likely the world population will double. And if you want to grasp what that means, think of food. In Scientific American, we read that world food production will have to increase threefold in the next 40 years to meet the needs of an estimated 9 billion people. And if you enjoy doing arithmetic, you can calculate that if this modest 1.7% per year continued unchanged in the future, 
the world population would grow to a density of one person per square meter on the dry land surface of the earth in just 600 years, and the mass of people would equal the mass of the earth in just 1,800 years. Now, we can smile at those. We know they didn't happen. This one makes for a cute cartoon. The caption says, excuse me, sir, but I am prepared to make you a rather attractive offer for your square. Now, there's a very profound lesson in that cartoon. The lesson is that zero population growth is going to happen. Now, we can debate whether we like zero population growth or don't like it. It's going to happen whether we debate it or not, whether we like it or not. It's absolutely certain. People could not live at that density on the dry land surface of the earth. Therefore, today's very high birth rate will drop, today's low death rate will rise till they have exactly the same numerical value that will certainly be in a time short compared to 600 years. So maybe you're wondering, well, what options are available to us? In the left-hand column, I've listed some of those things that we should encourage. If we want to raise the rate of growth of population and in so doing make the population problem worse, just look at the list. Everything in the list is as sacred as motherhood. There's immigration. This increases the population. There's medicine, public health, sanitation. These are all devoted to the humane goals of lowering the death rate, and that's very important to me if it's my death they're lowering. But then I have to realize that anything that just lowers the death rate makes the population problem worse. There's peace, law and order, scientific Cultures lowered the death rate due to famine. That just makes the population problem worse. The 55 mile an hour speed limit saved thousands of lives. That makes the population problem worse. Clean air makes it worse. Now in the right hand column are some of the things that we should encourage if we want to lower the rate of growth of population and in so doing help solve the population problem. Well, there's contraception, abortion, small families, stop immigration, there's disease, war, murder, famine, accidents. Now, smoking clearly raises the death rate. Now, that helps solve the problem. Well, remember our conclusion from the cartoon of one person per square meter. We concluded that zero population growth is going to happen. Now, let's state that conclusion in other terms and say it's obvious. Nature is going to choose from the right-hand list. So we don't have to do anything except be prepared to live with what nature chooses from that right-hand list, or we can exercise the one option that's open to us. And that option is to choose first from the right-hand list. We've got to find something here we can go out and campaign for. Anyone here for promoting disease? We now have the capability of incredible war. Would you like more murder, more famine, more accidents? Here you can see the human dilemma. Everything that we regard as makes the population problem worse. Everything we regard as bad helps solve the problem. Now, there is a dilemma if ever there was one. And the one remaining question is where does education go? Is it in the left-hand column or the right-hand column? I would have to say thus far it's been firmly in the left-hand column because it's done very little to reduce ignorance of the problem. And so where do we start? Let's start with a semi-logarithmic graph of the population of Boulder, Colorado. Now, if we take the census figure for 1950 to 1960 to 1970, that straight line indicates a growth rate of 6% per year. Now, with big efforts, we've been able to get this population growth rate reduced. But let's take the 1990 census figure and ask, what growth rate would we need for another 70 years following 1990, up to the year 2060, so that the population of Boulder in 2060 would equal the 1990 population of your choice of a major American city. Well, Boulder in 2060 could be as big as Boston if we just grew two and three quarters percent per year. Now, if we thought Detroit was a better model, we have to shoot for 3.6 percent per year. But remember the historic figure on the preceding slide, 6% per year. If that could continue for one lifetime, Boulder would be larger than Los Angeles. Well, I'll tell you, you couldn't put Los Angeles in the Boulder Valley. Therefore, it's obvious that Boulder's population growth is going to stop. Now, the only question is, will we be able to stop it while there's still some open space, or will we wait until it's wall-to-wall -wall people and we're all choking to death? Now, the problem's been around for a long time. 
Here's a more recent clipping indicating that it is still a problem. For a number of years, world-class athletes moved to Boulder in order to do their training here because the air was clean. But in early 1993, we read that the dirty air in Boulder is running some of these world-class athletes out of town. Now, it's interesting to read some of the things that are written about this. In one of those typical brochures that boost the city, we read that doubling its population in 10 years, Boulder is indeed a stable community. Now, what in the world are they talking about? You're going 100 miles an hour, you're doubling every 10 years, you're going 7% growth per year, and somebody says, we're stable, we're standing still, we're not moving. It's absolutely crazy, the kinds of things that you read about growth. Now, every once in a while, somebody says to me, but you know, a bigger city might be a better city. And I say, but wait a minute, that experiment's been done. We don't need to wonder what would be the effect of growth on Boulder because Boulder can be seen in Los Angeles today. And for the price of an airplane ticket, we can step 70 years into the future and we can see exactly what it's like. And what is it like? Well, there's just one aspect of what life is like in Los Angeles and we're headed in this exact direction in most of the cities of the United States and of the world. Now, growth control is very controversial in Boulder, and I treasure the letter from which these quotations are taken. Now, this letter was written to me by a leading citizen of our community. He's a leading proponent of controlled growth. Now, controlled growth just means growth. This man writes, I take no exception to your arguments regarding exponential growth. I don't believe the exponential argument is valid at the local level. And so, you see, arithmetic doesn't hold in Boulder. Now, I have to admit, that man has a degree from the University of Colorado. It's not a degree in mathematics, in science, or in engineering. Well, let's look now at what happens when we have this kind of steady growth in a finite environment. Bacteria grow by doubling, and one bacterium divides to become two, the two divide to become four, the four become eight, sixteen, and so on. Suppose we had bacteria that double in number this way every minute, Suppose we put one of these bacteria in an empty bottle at 11 in the morning and then observe that the bottle's full at 12 noon. Now there's our case of just ordinary, steady growth. It has a doubling time of one minute and it's in the finite environment of one bottle. And so I'd like to ask you three questions. Number one, at what time was the bottle half full? Well, would you believe 11.59, one minute before 12? because they double in number every minute. This is the characteristic of steady growth. Second question, if you were an average bacterium in that bottle, at what time would you first realize that you were running out of space? Well, let's just look at the last minutes in the bottle. At 12 noon, it's full. One minute before, it's half full. Two minutes before, it's a quarter full. Then an eighth and a sixteenth. Well, let me ask you, at Five minutes before 12, when the bottle's only 3% full and is 97% open space just yearning for development, how many of you would realize that there was a problem? Now, in the ongoing controversy over growth in Boulder, someone wrote to the newspaper some years ago and said, look, there's no problem with population growth in Boulder because, the writer said, we've got 15 times as much open space as we've already used. So let me ask you, what time is it in Boulder when the open space is 15 times the amount of space we've already used? Well, you can see it's 4 minutes before 12 in Boulder Valley. Well, suppose that at 2 minutes before 12, some of the bacteria realize that they're running out of space, so they launch a great search for new bottles. And they search offshore and on the outer continental shelf, in the overthrust belt, and in the Arctic, and they find three new bottles. Now, that's a colossal discovery. The discovery is three times the amount of resource they ever knew about before. They now have four bottles before the discovery there was only one. Now, surely, this will make them self-sufficient in space, won't it? Well, you know what the third question is. How long can the growth continue as a result of this magnificent discovery? Well, just look at the score. At 12 noon, one bottle's filled. There are three to go. At 12.01, two bottles are filled. There are two to go. And at 12.02, all four are filled and that's the end of the line. Now, you don't need any more arithmetic than this to evaluate the 
absolutely contradictory statements that you have heard and read from experts who tell us in one breath we can go on increasing our rates of consumption of fossil fuels. And in the next breath they say, but don't worry, we'll always be able to make the discoveries of new resources that we need to meet the requirements of that growth. Well, some years ago in Washington, our energy secretary observed that in the energy crisis, we have a classic case of exponential growth against a finite source. Okay, so where do we stand now? Let's summarize. Five points. We've seen that modest rates of steady growth of numbers of things quickly give enormous numbers. Number two, steady growth is displayed in the example of compound interest of money in a savings account. Number three, the rate of growth of populations and of inflation will fluctuate about an average growth rate. This still leads to enormous numbers in modest periods of time. Steady growth of the rate of consumption of a non-renewable resource leads to very quick expiration of the resource. And number five, most people have little or no idea about these effects of steady growth. In this part, we've seen that steady growth of numbers of things quickly lead to enormous numbers. And we've seen that if you have steady growth in the rate of consumption of a finite resource, that the expiration time comes very, very quickly. In part two, we want to carry this over and apply it to the Earth's finite reserves of several fossil fuels, to such things as petroleum and coal, so that we can see what lies ahead for our energy-intensive global society. In the first part, we looked at the way in which steady growth can produce very, very large numbers. Then we saw the way in which steady growth, the rate of consumption of a finite resource could lead to the very surprisingly early expiration of that resource. We want now to look at some specific resources and we want to start by looking at world petroleum consumption. Here we have a semi-logarithmic graph of world petroleum consumption prepared by the late Dr. M. King Hubbard. And it shows for the period from 1870 up to 1970. And you can see the line's been approximately straight. Average growth rate close to 7% per year. Now, it's logical to ask, well, how much longer could that 7% have continued after 1970? That's answered by the numbers in this table. In the top line, the numbers tell us that in the year 1973, world oil consumption was 20 billion barrels. The total consumption in all of history, including that 20, was 300 billion. The remaining oil reserves, 1,700 billion. Now, those are data. The rest of this table is just calculated out. Assume that the historic 7% growth that we'd seen for 100 years continued steadily in the years following 1973. Now, fortunately, the growth did not continue. Because of the high prices from OPEC, the growth stopped. So we're asking what if? Suppose the growth had continued. Well, let's look at the year 1981. By 1981, on the 7% curve, the total usage in all of history would add up to 500 billion barrels. The remaining reserves at that point, 1,500 billion. Now note, at that point, the remaining oil reserves would be three times the total of everything that had been used in the entire history of the oil industry on this earth. By most measures, you'd say that's an enormous remaining reserve. But what time is it when the remaining reserve is three times the total of all that you've used in all of history? And the answer is it's two minutes before 12. We've seen for 7% annual growth, the doubling time is 10 years. We go from 1981 to 1991. In 1991, on the 7% curve, the total usage in all of history would add up to 1,000 billion barrels. The remaining oil reserves at that point, another 1,000 billion barrels. Now, at that point, the remaining oil would be equal in quantity to the total of everything that had been used in something like 140 years of the oil industry on this earth. By most measures, you'd say that is still an enormous reserve. But what time is it when the remaining reserve is equal to all that you've used in all of history? And the answer is it's one minute before 12. 
And so we go one more decade to the turn of the century and we find that's when 7% would finish using up all the oil reserves of the earth. Now there's something very important to note here. The author of this table added three extra years after the end of the petroleum. I want you to understand the meaning of those three years. That is the total length of time that that 7% growth would continue if you consumed all of the known oil shale on this earth. Three extra years of 7% annual growth in the rate of consumption of oil. Now let's look at this in a very nice graphical way. Suppose the area of the tiny rectangle in the upper left represents all the oil that we used on this earth before the decade of the 1940s. Then in the 1940s we used this much. That's equal to the total of all that have been used in all of preceding history. In the decade of the 50s we used this much. That's equal to the total of all that have been used in all of preceding history. In the decade of the 60s, we use this much, and again, that's equal to the sum of everything that had been used before. Now, here you see graphically the thing that President Carter told us. If the 7% had continued through the 70s, if it had continued through the 80s, and if it continued through the 90s, here's what we need. But that's all the oil there is. Now, there's a widely held belief in the Congress that if you throw enough money at holes in the ground, oil is sure to come up. Now, there will be discoveries of new oil. There may be major discoveries, but look, we have to discover this much new oil if we would have that 7% growth continue another 10 years. So let me ask you, what do you think is the chance that oil discovered after the close of this tape will be equal in quantity, the total of all we've known about in all of history, and then realize if all that new oil could be found, that would be sufficient to let the historic 7% growth rate continue 10 extra years. Now you see interesting representations of this. Here's an interview in Time magazine with one of the most widely quoted oil experts in all of Texas. He's asked, but haven't many of our bigger fields been drilled nearly dry? And he responds, there's still as much oil to be found in the U.S. as has ever been produced. Now let's assume he's right. What time is it? And the answer is it's one minute before 12. Now, let's just see what this means in terms, for instance, of food. Let's look at a very interesting definition of modern agriculture. Modern agriculture is the use of land to convert petroleum into food. And we can see the end of the petroleum. Well, in the crisis in the early 1970s, ads such as this appeared. This is from the American Electric Power Company. It was a bit reassuring, sort of saying, now don't worry too much because we're sitting on half of the world's known supply of coal. Now, where did that figure come from? Well, it may have had its origin in this report to the Committee on Interior and Insular Affairs of the United States Senate because in this report we find this sentence. At current levels of output and recovery, these American coal reserves can be expected to last more than 500 years. Now there's one of the most dangerous statements in the literature. It's dangerous because it's true. But it isn't the truth that makes it dangerous. The danger lies in the fact that people take the sentence apart. They just say coal will last 500 years and they forget the caveat with which the sentence started. Now what were those opening words? At current levels. Now what does that mean? That means if and only if we maintain zero growth of coal consumption in the United States. So let's look at a few numbers. From the annual Energy Review 1991 published by the United States Department of Energy, we find this figure for the coal demonstrated reserve base. Also there is the footnote that about half of the demonstrated reserve base of coal in the United States is estimated to be recoverable. So this figure is half of this figure. So if you want to calculate how long coal could last, we'll calculate it for each of the figures and then say that the answer is probably in between the answers we get from each of the two calculations. Now that 1991 review also gave these figures for the rate of consumption of coal in 1971 and in 1991. If you put those two together to find the average growth rate of coal consumption in the United States over that 20 year period, you have 2.86% per year. And we'll come back to that 2.86 in just a moment. And so you might ask, well, how long could a resource last if you had steady growth in the rate of consumption till the last bit of it was used? Well, I'll just show you this equation for the expiration time 
I'll tell you it takes first year college calculus to derive this equation, so it can't be very difficult. You know, I have the feeling there must be dozens of people in this country have had first year college calculus. But let me suggest I think this equation is probably the best kept scientific secret of the century. Now let me show you why. If you use this equation to calculate the life expectancy of U.S. coal using the reserve base or the one half of the reserve base that they estimate might be recovered, for different steady rates of growth, you find if the growth rate is zero, the small estimate would go 236 years. The large estimate would go 473 years. And that's close enough to 500 so that we can say that report to the Congress was correct. But look what we get if we plug in steady growth. President Gerald Ford set goals of coal growth of around 8% per year. If that could be sustained until the coal was gone, coal in this country would last between 37 and 46 years. President Carter cut that goal roughly in half, hoping to reach a goal of 4% growth per year in coal consumption. If that could be continued until the coal was gone, coal would last between 59 and 75 years. Here is that 2.86% per year. The average over the 20 years from 1971 to 1991, if that average growth rate continued, coal would expire between 72 and 94 years. Now that's within the life expectancy of children born in 1991. The only way we're going to get anywhere near 500 years worth of coal is to have zero growth and to plan to use essentially all of the coal. Now, let's look at the history of coal consumption in the United States. Here, from the work of the late Dr. M. King Hubbard, we have the semi-logarithmic graph of U.S. coal consumption. From the close of the American Civil War to about the year 1910, coal consumption grew steadily, almost 6.7% per year. Then, as we switched to liquid petroleum and natural gas, we experienced zero growth of coal production for a period of 60 years. This straight line represents the average growth rate of coal consumption for the period 1971 to 1991. Now, the interesting question to ask is, how long could we continue if we start with the 1991 figure and continued on a 6.7% growth curve? And the answer is coal in this country would run out in 52 years. And so the calculated expiration times and the graph showing the history of coal mining in the United States, these are representations of facts. These are drawn from authoritative sources. I ask you, please keep these facts in mind. In the 1970s, there was great national concern about energy, but the concern disappeared in the 1980s. The concerns about energy in the 1970s prompted experts, journalists, and scientists to assure the American people that there was no reason for concern. We look now at some of these assurances from the 1970s so that we can see what we can expect when the energy crisis returns. Here is the director of the energy division of the Oak Ridge National Laboratories telling us how expensive it is to import oil, telling us we must have big increases in our consumption of coal, and telling us that under these conditions, he estimates America's coal reserves are so huge, they could last a minimum of 300 years, probably a maximum of 1,000 years. You've just seen the facts. Now you see what an expert tells us, and what can you conclude? There was a three-hour television special on CBS on energy. The reporter showed the enormous efforts being made to achieve rapid growth of coal consumption in the United States. In summary, the reporter said, by the lowest estimate, we have enough coal for 200 years, by the highest enough for more than a thousand years. You've just seen the facts. Now you see what a journalist tells us after careful study. And what can you conclude? From the Journal of Chemical Education, we have an article written by the staff of that journal. And in there, we read that our proof coal reserves are enormous, and they give a figure. These could satisfy present U.S. energy needs for nearly a thousand years. Well, let's do long division. You take the coal they say is there, divide by what was then the current rate of consumption and you get 180 years. But they didn't say current rate of consumptions. They said present U.S. energy needs. Well, coal today supplies about one-fifth, about 20% of the energy we use in this country. So if you'd like to calculate how long this quantity of coal 
could satisfy present U.S. energy needs, you have to multiply this denominator by five. When you do that, you get 36 years. They said nearly a thousand years. Newsweek magazine in a cover story on energy said at present rates of consumption, we have enough coal for 666.5 years. Now, the 0.5 means it'll run out in July instead of January. Now, if you overlook the fact that they don't understand the meaning of significant figures, if you round that off and say it's roughly 650 years, that's a reasonable number. But that's at present rates of consumption, meaning zero growth. But the whole point of the article that went with this was that we have to have rapid growth in our rate of consumption of coal. Now, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? If you have rapid growth in the rate of consumption, it won't last as long as it would last with zero growth. I wrote them a long letter. I pointed out that I thought this was a serious misrepresentation to give the readers the feeling we can have all the growth that's the subject of the article and still have coal around for 650 years. Well, you know, I got back a nice form letter that had nothing to do with what I'd tried to explain to them. I gave this talk in a high school in Omaha, and after the talk, the high school physics teacher came to me, and he had a booklet. He said, have you seen this? And I hadn't seen it. He said, look at this. We've got coal coming out of our ears as reported by Forbes magazine, now that's a prominent business magazine, the United States has 437 billion tons of known coal reserves. That's a good number. This is equivalent to a lot of BTUs, or it's enough energy to keep 100 million large electric generating plants going for the next 800 years or so. Well, the teacher said to me, how could that be true? That's one large electric generating plant for every two people in the United States. And I said, of course it can't be true. It's absolutely crazy. Let's do long division to see how crazy it is. So you take the coal they say is there, divide by what was then the current rate of consumption, you get 670 years. We couldn't keep that rate of consumption up for 800 years. We hardly have 500 large electric generating plants. They said it would be good for 100 million such plants. Time Magazine observed that certainly the coal is there beneath the pitheads of Appalachia and the Ohio Valley and under the sprawling strip mines of the West. Lye coal seems rich enough to meet the country's power needs for centuries, no matter how much energy consumption may grow. And so I give you a very fundamental observation. Don't believe any prediction of the life expectancy of a non-renewable resource until you have confirmed the prediction by repeating the calculation. And as a corollary, we have to note that the more optimistic the prediction, the greater is the probability that it's based on faulty arithmetic or on no arithmetic at all. Again, from Time Magazine, we read that energy industries agree that to achieve some form of energy self-sufficiency, the U.S. must mine all of the coal that it can. Now think about that for just a moment. Let me paraphrase it. The more rapidly we consume our resources, the more self-sufficient we'll be. Isn't that what it says? David Brower calls this the policy of strength through exhaustion. Now here's an example of strength through exhaustion. Here is William Simon, energy advisor to the President of the United States. And Simon says we should be trying to get as many holes drilled as possible to get the proven oil reserves. The more rapidly we can get the rest of that oil up out of the ground and finish using it, the better off we'll be. So let's look at the rate at which have been able to take petroleum from the ground in the United States. Again, from the work of the late Dr. M. King Hubbard, we have here a semi-logarithmic plot. You can see that the line's been straight for quite a while, average growth rate around 8% per year. But for some time now, the rate of extraction has fallen way below the growth curve while our demand continued on up that curve. Now, it's obvious that the difference between those two curves has to be made up with imports. And it was back in 1976 that we read that for the first month in nation's history, we had to import more oil than we were able to take from our ground ourselves. Now, with the big price increases from OPEC, that fraction fell back below 50 percent. But in early 1990, we read that oil imports hit an all-time high of 54 percent of our nation's petroleum consumption in January of 1990. So we're back up on the growth curve. Now, maybe you're wondering if it makes any sense to imagine that we could have steady growth the consumption of a resource till the last bit of it was used and then the rate of consumption would plunge abruptly to zero. And I say, no, that does not make sense. And you say, well, then why bother us with the calculation of this expiration time? My answer is this. Every segment of our society, our business leaders, government leaders, industrial leaders, political leaders at the local, state, and national level, everyone aspires 
to maintain a society in which all measures of material consumption continue to grow steadily year after year after year, world without end. Now, since that is so central to everything we do, we ought to know where it would lead. On the other hand, we should recognize that there is a better model. The late Dr. Hubbard studied the rate of consumption of resources that have already expired. He found, yes, there is an early period of steady growth in the rate of consumption, but then the rate goes through a maximum and comes back down in a nice symmetric bell-shaped curve. And when he fits that curve to the data on U.S. oil consumption, he finds that today we're right here. We've used more than half of the recoverable oil that was ever in the ground in the United States. Now that's roughly what that Texas expert said. Now let's see what it means. It means that from now on, the rate of extraction of oil from the ground in the United States can only go steadily downhill, and it's downhill all the rest of the way, and it doesn't matter what they say inside the Beltway in Washington, D.C. Now it means we could work hard and put bumps on the downhill side of the curve. You'll see there are bumps on the uphill side. The debate continues over drilling in the Arctic wildlife refuge. The largest number I've seen is an estimate for the oil they might find there is 3.2 billion barrels. Well, 3.2 billion barrels is the area of this tiny square. It's less than one year's consumption in the United States, and that's what all the debate is about. So let's look at the curve in this way. Area under the curve represents a quantity of the resource. So the total area under the total curve, that's the size of the total resource before any of it was used. We've divided that here into three parts. Unshaded on the left, that's the oil we've taken from the ground. We've used it, it's gone. The narrow, blue-shaded vertical band here, that's the oil we've drilled into, we've found it, we've counted it, we're pumping on it today. Shaded in green on the right, that is the undiscovered oil. We now know how much oil remains undiscovered in the United States. This is the oil we're looking for in all the places where drilling is going on. This is the oil we've got to find if we're going to make it down the curve on schedule. Now, it's very important to note, as people often remind me, that back around the turn of the century, somebody predicted that we would be out of oil in the United States in 25 years. We obviously were not. That calculation must have been wrong. Therefore, some people conclude calculations are wrong. Let's see what happened. Back at the turn of the century, that narrow blue-shaded vertical band was way over here on the left. All they did then was to take the amount of oil they knew about, they had discovered, divided by how rapidly it was being used, and come up with 25 years. Now that calculation has to be redone every time you make a new discovery. Today we're not talking just about the oil we know about, we're talking about the oil we've discovered plus the oil we have not discovered, we are now talking about the rest of the oil. And so maybe you're wondering, why didn't somebody tell us this? Well, it was back in 1956 that Dr. Hubbard addressed a convention of petroleum geologists and engineers. He told them that his analysis led him to the conclusion that the peaks that you just saw of U.S. oil and gas production could be expected to occur between 1966 and 1971, and no one took him seriously. So let's see what's happened. Here we have a graph showing millions of barrels of oil a day taken from the ground in the United States as a function of time. It was back here in 1956 that Dr. Hubbard did his analysis. He said then that this rate of extraction would reach a peak between 1966 and 1971. Well, you can see the peak was reached in 1970. It was followed by a very rapid decline, a slow recovery, and then a very rapid decline down the right-hand side of the curve. The left side of this curve is oil taken from the ground in the lower 48 states. If you continue the points for that oil, it is continuing right on down like this. And this bump, this recovery and fall, that's the Alaska pipeline that had a peak here sometime in the mid-1980s. And so you can sort of see here the peak of the Hubbard curve for the total 50 states. And if you do, as two of my colleagues in physics have done, stand back and look at the whole Hubbard curve, you see here the little tiny dots, those represent the rates of extraction. There is the peak in 1970, there's the peak from the Alaska pipeline, and now we're falling very rapidly down the right-hand side of that curve, just as Dr. Hubbard projected. The Geological Survey in 1984 told us that the estimated U.S. supply from undiscovered resources, that area on the right side of that earlier graph, and demonstrated reserves that we know about, 
was 36 years of present rates of production or 19 years in the absence of imports. The survey later in 1989 tells us that the 36 years is down to 32 years and the 19 years is down to 16 years. The numbers are holding together as we march down the right-hand side of the Hubbard curve. Now in October of 1993, the news reports told of the largest oil discovery in the Gulf of Mexico in 20 years, 700 million barrels of oil. How long would that last in the United States? Do the long division, 42 days worth of consumption in the United States. Let's look at the global situation. In 1972, Dr. Hubbard made this projection of the global rate of extraction of oil. He predicted that the maximum rate of extraction would be reached before the year 2000. I have talked with geologists, and they think it's going to be a little bit later than Dr. Hubbard had projected. They think the latest it could possibly be is the year 2020, but most likely it'll be before the year 2010. Here we see a graph of the actual consumption of oil on a global scale. You can see the early period curves up. That's a period of steady growth that we had for over 100 years. You can see the first oil price shock. And the second oil price shock as OPEC raised their oil prices. When you look at this curve, you cannot tell for sure whether we have yet reached the maximum or where the maximum will likely be. It's interesting to look at what's reported here in one of the World Oil Journals. They tell us that genuine new discoveries of oil over the past decade, which is from 1984 to 1994, has averaged 8.6 billion barrels a year compared to consumption of almost 26 billion barrels a year, consumption running three times the rate of discovery. So compare that now with what we read in Popular Science in October of 93. They say that instead the discoveries of petroleum reserves continue to outstrip increases in demand, keeping prices low. Exactly the opposite in these two presentations. Only one of them can be correct. Now here we have a story that an oil executive says that an oil supply will last for 50 years. You have to look through that entire article. You don't find any numbers that you can use in doing arithmetic to see whether he means at present rates of consumption or with the growth of consumption rates that we're experiencing. It's an incredibly brief article that doesn't give us any real information. And Dr. Hubbard addressed a committee of the Congress. He told them that the exponential phase of the industrial growth, which has dominated human activities during the last couple of centuries, is now drawing to a close. Yet during the last two centuries of unbroken industrial growth, we have evolved what amounts to an exponential growth culture. Well, I would say it's more than a culture. It's our national religion. We worship growth. Pick up any newspaper, you'll see stories such as this. State forecast robust growth. Have you ever heard of a physician diagnosing a cancer in the patient and telling the patient you have a robust cancer? Here is a local business firm. Their third quarter orders are disappointing. And an official says that anything under the 40 to 50 percent growth rate would be disappointing to us. Now, how much do you have to know to realize you couldn't have 40 to 50 percent growth rate of anything real for very long? And if you're counting on it, it is absolutely guaranteed in advance that you're going to be disappointed. Yet I'll bet this guy's got a college degree. IBM's in trouble because they invested heavily in new buildings equipment and employees in the belief that their revenues would keep growing. You don't need a computer to do this kind of arithmetic. While Americans were being killed in the Gulf War, the economist tells us that the Gulf situation may hurt Colorado's growth. We worship growth. It's the most important thing in our entire society. And we see at the national level the promise of more growth. But it isn't just a national phenomenon, it's an international phenomenon. In the Wall Street Journal, we read that the Japanese are so accustomed to growth that economists in Tokyo usually speak of a recession as any time when the growth rate dips below 3%. So what do we do? Well, in the words of Winston Churchill, sometimes we have to do what is required. We must educate all of our people to an understanding of the arithmetic and the consequences of growth, especially in terms of populations and in terms of the Earth's finite resources. We must educate people to recognize the fact the growth of populations and growth in rates of consumption of resources cannot be sustained. We must educate people to see the need to examine carefully 
the allegations of the technological optimists who assure us that technological fixes will always be found whenever they are needed. For these technological optimists, the looming decline and expiration of fossil fuels presents no problem. They believe that scientists will discover substitute energy sources whenever those substitutes are needed. These technological optimists are popular, persuasive, and powerful. They've played a major role in shaping today's society in which we see astounding affluence alongside of grinding poverty, and the gap between those two societies is growing wider every year. A leader among these technological optimists is Dr. Julian Simon, formerly professor of economics and business administration at the University of Illinois, and more recently adjunct scholar of the Heritage Foundation. With regard to copper, Simon has written that we will never run out of copper because copper can be made from other metals. Now the letters to the editor jumped all over him on this question, told him about chemistry, and he just brushed it all aside and said, if we ever need to be able to make copper from other metals, we will be able to figure out a way to do it. He has absolute faith that the human intellect can solve every problem. He had a book that was published by the Princeton University Press, and in that book he's talking about oil from many sources, including biomass, and he says clearly there's no meaningful limit to this, this source except for the sun's energy. And he goes on to note that even if our sun were not so vast as it is, there may well be other suns elsewhere. Well, Simon's right. There are other suns elsewhere. But the question is, we base public policy on the belief that if we ever need another sun, we'll figure out a way to bring it in. Now, this man was a major policy advisor in Washington throughout the Reagan and Bush administrations. This book, published by the Princeton University Press, was reviewed in the Chronicle of Higher Education. The Chronicle tells us that economists interviewed by the Chronicle gave Simon high marks for his discussion of natural resources. More recently, Simon had a guest editorial telling us that energy is becoming more abundant. The more we use, the more there is. Now, Simon has very strong support from many people high in government. Here we have a report from the United Nations Agency that warned about resource collapse because of population growth. When asked about the report, HUD Secretary Jack Kemp said nonsense. People are not a drain on the resources of the planet. Malcolm Forbes, Jr., editor-in-chief of the Forbes magazine, wrote that CNN recently ran a silly series purporting to show that the world is in mortal danger because there are too many of us. In poorer countries, these many mouths mean poverty. In richer countries, we're wrecking the Earth's atmosphere with pollution. It's all nonsense. Our late colleague here at the University of Colorado, Professor Kenneth Boulding, had the very cogent observation about population. He called his dismal theorem. And it says that if the only ultimate check on the growth of population is misery, then the population will grow till it is miserable enough to stop its growth. Now he followed that with what he called the moderately cheerful form of the dismal theorem. And it says if something else other than misery and starvation can be found which will keep a prosperous population in check, then the population does not to grow till it is miserable and starves, and it can be stably prosperous. The former president of Cornell University observed that we live in an exponential world in which the scientific and technical problems that beset us are growing exponentially, and we have inadequate mechanisms for setting priorities and addressing the problems. We do not see the light until we feel the heat. The engine that drives many of these world problems is world population growth. In a book review in Scientific American, the reviewer is Robert May, Royal Society Research Professor at the University of Oxford and Imperial College in London. In reviewing a book on biology, he says that the author says relatively little about continuing growth of human populations, but this is the engine that drives everything. Patterns of accelerating resource use and their variation among regions are important, but secondary. The problem Wasteful consumption can be solved if population growth is halted, but such solutions are essentially irrelevant if populations continue to proliferate. Every day the planet sees a net increase of births minus deaths of about a quarter of a million people. 
Such numbers defy intuitive appreciation, yet many religious leaders seem to welcome these trends, seemingly motivated by calculations about their market share. And governments, most notably that of the United States, keep the issue off the international agenda, witness the Earth Summit meeting in Rio de Janeiro. Until this changes, I see little hope. And in one hour, the world population has increased by about 11,000 people, and the United States population has increased in that one hour by about 260 people. So let's see what this means in the United States. From July 1 of 92 to 93, the U.S. Census Bureau estimated that the U.S. population increased in that 12 months by 2.7 million people. Now let's make a guess. Let's guess that a third of those people need jobs. Now, it could be a half, it could be a quarter. I don't know. But if a third of those need jobs, we've got to create 900,000 new jobs a year before there's any reduction in the number of people out of work. And jobs aren't a problem just in the United States. In early 1994, we read that the world faces the worst employment crisis in 60 years. Bill Moyers interviewed Isaac Asimov, the great science writer, and asked him what happens to the idea of the dignity of the human species if this population growth continues at its present rate. And Asimov answered, it will be completely destroyed. I like to use what I call my bathroom metaphor. If two people live in an apartment and there are two bathrooms, then both have the freedom of the bathroom. You can go to the bathroom anytime you want, as long as you want to do whatever you need. And everyone believes in freedom of the bathroom. It should be right here in the Constitution. But if you have 20 people in the apartment and two bathrooms, no matter how much every person believes in freedom of the bathroom, there is no such thing. You have to set up times for each person. You have to bang on the door. Aren't you through yet? And so on. In the same way, democracy cannot survive over population. Human dignity cannot survive it. Convenience and decency cannot survive it. As you put more and more people into the world, the value of life not only declines, it disappears. It doesn't matter if someone dies. The more people there are, the less one individual matters. And so central to the things we have to do is to recognize that population growth is the immediate cause of all of our resource and environmental crises. But in spite of all these facts, there is movement to say that we should not worry about numbers of people. In the report of the World Commission on Environment and Development that appears in the book called Our Common Future, we read that the issue is not just numbers of people, but how those numbers relate to available resources. And so this is part of a movement to say, don't worry about numbers. We have to worry about other very important things, such as equity and equality. Other things are important, but we can't have the resources to do anything about those other things if we don't first look at population and look at numbers. We need to be reminded of the words of Aldous Huxley. He observed that facts do not cease to exist because they are ignored, and I might add, or because they are denied. Now, the things I tell you are not predictions of the future. I'm only reporting facts and the results of some very simple arithmetic. But I do this with confidence that these facts, this arithmetic, and more important, our level of understanding of them will play a major role in shaping our future. Now, don't take what I've said blindly or uncritically because of the rhetoric or for any other reason. You check the facts. You check my arithmetic. If you find errors, please let me know. But if you don't find errors, then I hope you'll take this very, very seriously. So how do we grow? Let's grow in wisdom and understanding. Let's grow in our ability to meet the challenges of developing new technologies to help achieve better lives for all of our people. But to be successful in this experiment of human life on Earth, we have to understand the laws of nature as they are encountered in the study of the sciences and the mathematics. And so I hope you can see why I feel this arithmetic is so important, and I hope that I've made a reasonable case for my opening statement that I think the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. Thank you very, very much.